um, what I'm going to be talking, what we're going to be talking about in this webinar, we're going to give a quick overview of INAS. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the AuthorAid project, uh, which my colleague Andy Nobes runs and he's going to be speaking about. And then I'll come back and tell you a little bit about some of the INAS online courses and tutorials. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Journals Online project, um, about the Think Check Submit initiative, and then there should be um, a good amount of time for questions at the end. And if at any point you want to add some questions into the chat, and we'll try and get through as many of those as, as possible during, during this. And if not, we'll try and share the materials um, afterwards. And of course, you can contact us uh, via Twitter and all our contact details were at the start of this as well. So, this is INASP's vision, um, research and knowledge at the heart of development. So our mission is to support individuals and institutions to produce, share and use research and knowledge to transform lives. Our full name is International Network for Advancing Science and Policy and we've been around for nearly 30 years. Um, we're based in Oxford in the UK but we work with a global network of partners across Africa, Asia and Latin America to strengthen research and knowledge systems for development. And that means we work with universities, research institutions, national science academies, think tanks, civil society organisations, government agencies and parliaments. So what does this actually mean? Because that's, you know, people will talk about their visions and things, but what we actually do uh, we have four main strands to our work, research capacity. So this is about um, strengthening research communication, um, strengthening, um, supporting uh, local publishing and helping the connections between research communication and how it's used. So how it's used in policy and wider engagement. Um, we work um, with edu higher education and learning, so working, um, starting at an undergraduate level, supporting um, teaching staff in embedding critical thinking skills into higher education, helping to ensure that higher education courses are the best they can be for providing the wider skills that people need when they leave university and go to um, get jobs and do other things in, in society um, and also about using evidence in policy so that might be academic research but it might be all sorts of other um, knowledge that's generated in, in civil society and about also about supporting impact. So over the years, we've actually we've de designed and delivered hundreds of different um, what we call capacity building uh, interventions and programs to make knowledge systems more equitable. So equity runs through through everything, whether it's it's gender equity, geographical equity. Um, this is a really important theme for um, what we do. But the particular thing we want to talk about uh, for quite a lot of this. Uh, session is about our author aid project which is particularly about supporting um, researchers so supporting researchers through mentoring collaborating collaboration discussions online online courses journal clubs resources and building community and um, i'm hoping that that my colleague andy is is here and that i can hand over to andy to Great. That's uh, so. May I introduce my colleague Andy, who runs our Author Aid program, and he is going to talk through some of the ways that we work here. And Andy, if you just want to tell me when you'd like me to advance slides, that would be that would be great. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, apologies, everyone. I, I got my time zone slightly wrong, and um, I was running slightly late for the session, but I'm here now. So, um, thank you for the introduction, Sean. So um, AuthorAid, as Sean has already pointed out, is a, a particular part of, of INASP uh, focusing on research communication. So it's a project that's been going about, um, I think, 11 years now. 
and the the focus of author aid is to help researchers young researchers early career researchers in the, the global south in africa latin america and asia and over the years we've built up a community of over 20,000 researchers from all over the world from what well, we say 174 plus countries but i think we've more or less managed to find um researchers and others in every every country in the world i think apart from greenland so um we provide lots of different services for young researchers on our website um, just to quickly say that everything that we provide is actually free at the point of use so as a researcher you can come onto our website sign up for all of the things that we offer and they are of no charge to you over the years we have provided different things for our website so if you go go to look at what's on the website we've got lots of news uh, resources blog posts there's a, a resource bank with different types of, of useful stuff for you presentations links uh, resources and documents powerpoint presentations and um, podcasts and videos and things like that so you can find free resources through our resource bank we also have an online mentoring system and what this means is you can sign up on our website as part of our community of over 20,000 people and you can find collaborators and potentially even mentors we've got over 500 mentors who are signed up on our website they're experienced researchers from all over the world who have signed up to help young researchers through their research journey whether it's with um, for example data analysis and statistics whether it's through writing a grant proposal writing your paper publishing your paper or with general uh, research career advice there are over 500 mentors registered on our website and you can sign up and you can approach these mentors with for whatever help you're looking for there's also um, a range of online courses that we have developed. So um, historically, we used to do face-to-face -face training courses in writing up your research and getting it published in a journal and also in writing proposals. And um, we would do face-to-face -face training workshops for groups of early career researchers. As time has gone on, um, we have moved these more into online courses, which has been of particular use recently, um, of course, with the global pandemic. And um, we have built a suite of um, what we're calling massive online open courses in research writing and proposal writing. Um, and this map um, that we have here on screen actually gives a, an illustration of the kind of reach that we found through our open online courses. So you can see these are this is the kind of the population that quite often we represent uh, when we have thousands of people who come onto our online courses um, sometimes we have these pinboard map exercises where we uh, get people to identify where they're from which can be quite fun and a good introduction to the course so these online courses they are introductory courses to research writing and proposal writing they are deliberately low bandwidth courses so they cover um, they're designed in a way that you don't need to log, log on and watch lots of video lectures. They are text-based lessons which take you through all the different kind of aspects of research writing from um, planning ahead to doing your research, from doing a literature review, from actually carrying out the research or experiments, and then thinking about things such as research ethics um, and um, publication ethics, and then planning to, to write up your research actually writing a research paper so um some of the elements behind how you write in, in academic english for example how you write in a certain structure for particular types of journals and then we take you through some of the elements of how to publish your research in an academic journal sometimes there are some uh, things to think about about na navigating journal publishing and um, navigating through peer review different types of challenges you may find in for example publishing your research open access so those are some of the things sort of some of the things we cover in our online courses um, and um, i've just seen a, a comment come through in a chat box to me saying are these services for free yes the the online courses and the mentoring it is free to you as a researcher so you don't have to pay any fees to do the online courses or to to find a mentor um, and 
as you can see on screen here, you can see a snapshot of what um, one of our courses looks like. So we cover both um, research writing and, um, in the sciences and also in the social sciences. So there's a, a range of different themes that can be covered through the courses. And you can, if you go onto our website, you can see um, the dates of our online courses coming up over the next year. And see that there are different courses you can do covering different topics with some additional modules. Quite often in the courses, we do some um, sort of more interesting um, uh, participatory things, such as um, that you can see on the screen now, we've got these uh, the wall of different videos. This is called a, a flip grid, where we give participants the chance to talk about their research, um, record a, a quick video so that people can converse amongst each other. But our courses on the whole are very interactive. There's lots of social interaction uh, throughout the courses. Okay, um, do you want to change the slide again, Sean? Thank you. And um, we also have a quite a global community of facilitators. I already mentioned that we've got lots of um, mentors from around the world, um, all over the world, um, even as well as the US and Europe, also Africa, India, Latin America. Our facilitators are very diverse from, from lots of different countries and regions. And there's always an opportunity to, to step up to become a facilitator on our courses. So we have this, this team on each MOOC. Um, a guest facilitation team where, whereby we have a, a group of experts who answer questions in the discussion forums. And quite often we've had people who have completed our courses and then stepped up to become a facilitator in the next course. So there's always an opportunity to learn and then become a facilitator and pass on your learning to other people through our online courses. Um, next slide. So some interesting things that we found. Um, we've found that there is approximately a 50% completion rate on our massive online, online open courses, which is really good. It's much higher than the average MOOC completion rate. I think this is because the courses are tailored towards researchers in Africa and, and Asia and Latin America. So it's a, a good community of researchers and, and students working together to learn together. So um, yeah, please do sign up on, the, on one of our MOOCs and, and find out more. We also have a range of, and again, these are free resources that we've built up over time that you can take uh, from our AuthorAid website. You can use and you can adapt to your own circumstances. So these are not, not only good reading material for you as a researcher, but you can take them to your institution. You can adapt these and you can use them to train workshops at your university or research institution. And we've got um, our research writing um toolkits so we're calling these toolkits they can be adapted there's different exercises different presentations that can be used um, in different ways that you think are most appropriate for your institution but research writing um, workshop toolkit we've got a toolkit on effective mentorship in research communication um, a very similar one that we have a, a writing clubs um, context toolkit so you can take this to start um, start up a writing club at your institution and we've also got a toolkit which helps you to run your own train, your train the trainers workshop. So you can do a research writing workshop and your train the trainers workshop afterwards so that you can actually train your own facilitators uh, to uh, teach others to in research writing and research communication. So those are free resources you can take off our website and use at your own organization. Um, next slide. Um, okay. Yeah, that. Was that you next? Uh, yeah, that is me next, but <laughs> okay, it's not you, moving Sean. forward. But uh, I don't know well, if you wanted to say anything about the journal clubs. Yes, the journal clubs, good point. Um, what we've been doing over the last year, uh, we well, first of all, we have um, we have recently restarted a, a discussion group on Google Groups. And you can find out more about that on our website. Um, if you go to, I think it's the discussion tab on our website, it will redirect you to our new discussion group. Um, it's just restarted, it's got about 500 people, and it's a good place to ask questions and um, you'll get a response with the other members of the group. Another thing we've been trying out, parallel to that, we've started some online journal clubs, and these are being run using WhatsApp. And so um, these are groups of around 200 people in, in similar thematic areas. So we, we, we started three of, these, three of these off last year, one of them is in biomedicine and healthcare. One is in environmental 
biology and chemistry and another one is in the social sciences and we're hoping to start another one soon on climate change research and these are an opportunity to um, look at and discuss recent research papers in these themes so you can find out more about these on our website also the, the online journal clubs um, and also sign up to our um, the news page on our website and you'll be updated with what's going on in the authored community back uh, shall I go back to the show? <laughs> yeah so thank you okay. very thank you very much andy um as uh, as andy said there's loads of things going on so if you want to ask us more questions do take a look at the website do take a look at our social media we're giving you a bit of a whirlwind tour here and i'm going to continue the whirlwind tour now I, for some reason my keys are sticky so they're not actually moving forward as they should right so andy's told you about the online courses that inasp offers with authorate but actually there are some other courses as well that are um available that are not necessarily specifically about author aids. So we have a mixture of facilitated courses and self-paced tutorials. Um, these facilitated courses are, are ones that take place over a certain period of time. They, you, you've probably maybe experienced with this kind of thing where, where people send uh, a reminder at the start of the week saying this is the tasks that you need to do this week and then there are facilitators helping you to um, answer your questions and helping the discussion to move along um, and they finish at a particular time. We, we, so we have uh, the author aid courses that Andy mentioned but also we have online courses for journal editors um, as well as some smaller courses for particular groups for example when we're working with um, particular higher education institutions uh, we might have a a small course for lecturers in that institution. Um, the self-paced tutorials, there is a link for these here. These can be done entirely at participants' own pace. They are free, um, always open, no fees, um, like all of these um, things. The, the ones we have currently available um, in search strategies, basics of grant proposal writing, critical thinking. Um, we will shortly be launching um, a new tutorial in online facilitation skills. This came from actually talking to um, lecturers and other people we work with who's you know, in, in with the COVID-19 situation who suddenly found they were having to do more things online and um, and just wanted some some help in actually what how to how to do this, how to, what kind of tools to use, what what's successful and what works well. Um, in different situations. Um, so although with self, these self-paced tutorials, we don't provide any facilitation, we have noticed that sometimes organizations will create their own communities around things. So one example we have, um, we've been recently piloting and hopefully we'll be able to release this more broadly soon, a tutorial for librarians to help with them developing skills in monitoring and evaluation evaluating e-resource usage and I know there's quite a lot of librarians in this in this call so uh, we are hoping to make this more widely available soon. In, in the pilots we've been doing with library consortia we've seen that the library consortia invite particular librarians and then suggest that the tutorial happens over a particular time frame and created a whatsapp group that allows the various people doing the tutorial to talk, discuss ideas, ask questions, and also what seems to be a really big thing is celebrating when people finish and get their completion certificates. Because in these tutorials, you also still get a completion certificate. So um, next, going to tell you about another very quick thing. I mentioned previously about a course for journal editors. So one of the things that, oh, I'm sorry, I moved on and I didn't mean to. Um, one of the things that we, we got involved in in the late 90s was recognising that there is a huge um, imbalance between if you look at any of these global databases of, of journals, Web of Science or Scopus, they are really, really dominated by journals from Europe and from North America. Oh, I don't know why, but this, <laughs> this just keeps moving. Um, and I think I may have... Oh, I 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I've made a mess of this. If you're from current side. Um, yeah, okay, and hopefully you can back now see this slide again. So these databases are hugely dominated by journals from Europe and from North America, but actually there's a enormous wealth of, of journals from, um, from Africa and from Asia and from Latin America that were just not being seen. So the Journals Online project was started up, it's partnering with local organizations to, to be a home for, a electronic home for journals from particular countries and uh, to enable them to be searched and to enable them to be online and to be visible around the world. And this next slide, I, I'm, I'm really sorry because it, it clearly thinks I want to keep going with this. Um, but um, so we, it's not just about making journals visible, but also about the quality of publishing platforms uh, and practices, because a lot of the journals that dominate these big rankings are from enormous com companies with big budgets to do all sorts of things. Um, whereas a lot of the journals that are part of the journals online platform are run by groups of academics in universities which, who don't have the same budgets or necessarily the same time to do these things. So we, we launched, along with um, African Journals Online, we launched um, a couple of years ago, Journal Publishing Practices and Standards, which um, provides badges for the journals that are on these platforms, which gives an, a sense that they are, um, uh, shows that they have credible publishing practices and that, uh, that they can be trusted. Um, and these, these, this process, this assessment process, doesn't just help the people to see what the journals are like, but also helps the, the journal editors to know what they need to improve about, about their, their journals and to help to guide their plans as they develop their journals. Um, and this next slide has been desperate to come and join us. So um, one final thing to tell you about, this is something that INASP is part of, and that's Think, Check, Submit. I, I don't know whether people already have heard of this initiative, but this is an initiative of, of a wide range of groups around the world and um, groups like the um, Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association and the Director of, Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, and this is called a Think, Check, Submit. It's basically about identifying whether journals are trustworthy. So rather than a blacklist or a whitelist, actually having a, here are the kind of processes you need to think about when you are, um, when you're picking a journal, when you're thinking about whether it is uh, something you can trust. So this is the kind of thing on the checklist. Do you or your colleagues know about the journal? Can you identify and contact the publisher? Is the journal clear about the peer review process? So the details are on this slide here and do check it out. This isn't an INASP initiative, but it's something that we're part of as a founder member um, and is a, is a great way to think about things if you're not sure about a journal and not sure about if it's something that you can trust or if it might be a predatory journal. So that was the whirlwind tour of INASP. Um, these are our contact details, which I will keep up here for just, for just a moment, but um, we are now open to answer some questions. Um, and I saw that things were busy with the chat, but unfortunately, because I had my screen, I was sharing my screen, I couldn't see those questions. So I don't know if Andy, you've seen some of the questions. Yeah, I've been reading through, but I haven't actually seen any, I don't think we are seeing any direct questions for us, but there's a uh, hand we up. We have, yes. Uh, I see, I saw one, sorry. Yes, so I saw one, there, is, uh, there was one on online trainings about experimental design and data analysis. What was the question, sorry? Oh, right. well, I, think, I think I see it, yeah. Um, somebody's asked, oh, actually, I'm not sure I do. Um, is there an online training uh, about experimental design and data analysis recent time? I copy it to the chat, okay? Uh, so 
Oh, okay, okay, thank you. I think somebody asked me that um, privately as well. <laughs> so um, at the moment, um, on our online courses, which are focused on research writing, there is there is a part of um, some of the lessons which do cover data analysis and um, designing experiments and research methodology, but it only goes into it in uh, at quite a basic level. So we, we would recommend um, sort of additional training on those topics because it's not it's not um, a, to a subject that we cover in great depth. It's something we're wor working on developing a new module for possibly next year. Um, but we, we do cover this um, as a basic level. What we would recommend um, is that you go to our website and try to find a mentor. If you're, if you're looking for particular um, support and guidance in data analysis and research design, you may be able to, to search for a mentor on the AuthorAid website who can give you quite hands-on assistance with this as it's related to your discipline. So I would say um, feel free to sign up for our future online courses, but also look for a mentor on our website. I saw that someone called Amal has put a hand up. Uh, yes, did you want yeah. to ask a question? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to ask about um, if, uh, for example, we in the African countries, I come from Sudan, actually, and sometimes, and I have some master's students and some research PhD students, I'm uh, an associate professor in a, in a university in Sudan. And uh, sometimes if we, uh, about uh, the editing, I think if you can give us some kind of uh, editing services, because uh, sometimes we write well and uh, you see that um, for example our, our students have got uh, good English and everything but I think I think we, we still we cannot compete with the European world in writing and although we have courses about academic writing and so on if, if it is possible to have some kind of editing services is that uh, possible because it is very expensive to send to an uh, well trusting uh, well trusted editing uh, uh, company or something like that. This is a question. Another question is that uh, uh, if we have uh, about paying paying to publish, sometimes we have uh, an article with authors from uh, Africa and then one author from a European country. Then is that illegal for uh, waiver, waiver, wavering of fees? Good question. Um, two, two good questions, actually. Um, I mean, the, the first one, I mean, and Sharon, you feel free to, to also um, answer this as well. Um, the, the first question on the editing, I mean, that's, that's obviously a, a big issue, uh, um, particularly if English is not the first language of your, of your region. Um, whilst whilst we're, we're aware of there being editing companies that can provide this service, it's obviously quite expensive. Now, yes. there, there are... Um, yeah, there are many um, mentors listed on the AuthorAid website who actually provide this service. They, part of the, the offering which they're happy to provide um, at no cost is help with editing your paper. Um, yeah. if you, if, when, you, when you search for people on the AuthorAid website, make sure you look for um, language editing or proofreading. There, there are some that, that provide specifically scientific skills and career mentoring. That they're quite different types of mentor. They offer a different type of support, but there are also some that offer help with, with um, editing your paper. Just to okay. add, I'm I'm actually an author aid mentor myself. Um, my research background is chemistry, and I have edited a few papers to help people and and guided about about the English, but also a little bit about the my my research background is quite a long time ago, so a little bit rusty, but ask the kind of questions that um that people might want to think about that that feel like they're missing from a from the drafts i've seen so um i, I can't speak for all the mentors but that's certainly how i approach it when i'm mentoring great yes um, thank you the, very much the, the publish mm -hmm. the paying to publish question andy did you want to answer that or shall i um, I'm not, yeah i mean it's, it's a very, it's a very, very good question. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is that, I, I, and I saw that this is the top answer given in the poll that we did, um, difficulties paying to publish. So I think it's worth us kind of co covering this in some kind of um, depth. Um, quite often when, 
quite often when you're looking to publish in a journal, there, there may be a publication charge in some journals. It's, this is not always the case. This is only for um, reasonably high ranking open access journals. And quite often there will be a, other options where you don't need to pay as an author and you need to be aware of the different options that you have. Um, and quite often, um, as Amal has pointed out, there can be waivers to this. If you're living in a low income country, for example, Sudan, normally most publishers will provide you with a waiver for the publishing fee, for the article processing charge. The particular circumstance that you've um, mentioned, Amal, where there is a, a, one author who um, from a low income country, one author from a high income country, that kind of potentially complicates the issue. But that, I think in most cases, you should be pre prepared to ask the journal, ask the editor for a waiver. The, I think the, the, the rules aren't always as strict as you might think. Quite often journals are prepared to um, provide a waiver for you, uh, if, you know, if your research is really good and they really want your, it to feature in your journal, they particularly want a diversity of authorship. If you're in any doubt, just ask and you, you might be surprised at how, what opportunities that journal are provided, um, available to give to you. Sean, did you want to? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was so great. Okay. <laughs> uh, it seems like there's another question that's a little bit uh, similar about individuals access aid for publication for journals or institutions. Um, I, think, I think you've answered that that Andy actually about waivers from publishers. I'd just like to add a caution about if you are approached by a journal, this relates to the, the thing I was saying about think, check, submit. If you are approached by a journal that wants to publish your paper and they want you to pay a lot of money, do make sure that you check that the journal is one that, you, that can be trusted. Ask other people you know, look, see whether this is a journal that you that you would read, see whether it's a journal that you know people who've published in, because um, often the journals that are most rigid about insisting you pay are ones that are basically trying to get your money more than trying to promote, um, um, trying to promote um, your, your, your research. Um, so just be careful. Um, it's interesting, the question here, why are journals published in G8 um, nations considered to be of higher quality when indeed it's tougher publishing in national journals where there are more rigorous reviews? That is a really good question and a really important point. Um, that is, that is um, something that we, we keep challenging and we want to challenge, we want to help to promote visibility um, of journals around the um, around the world and the various issues, uh, it's a long process. It's a long um, it's a, a long and difficult challenge, and uh, I think we all kind of need to work together to to make sure that it isn't just the journals in the G eight countries that that get to call the shots about the about the way ahead. Um, well, it's a really interesting um, uh, question, um, really interesting the way that Joe said it, that sometimes it can be tougher publishing in the home, the national journals than it, uh, in terms of rig in terms of peer review than in mm. um, other journals, which is <laughs> something we don't hear that often actually, that it, I guess it just shows that even with national regional journals, there's still a high level of peer review that goes on. So never assume that some of these big, um, high impact and prestige journals will automatically have better peer review or are better quality journals. Um, what other questions do we have? Yeah, we have a question. How can I publish an article in a high impact journal? Well, um, that's a big question. <laughs> um, Sean, I think you've published in high impact journals, haven't you? I have. What do you think? Um, well, I uh, those were many years ago, and those, that was uh, the journals that my PhD advisor um, <laughs> picked. And so I, I'm not sure that that I had much control over it, really. But uh, um, 
I think you need um, you need to publish something. I mean, it depends. You need to, for any journal. It's not just a high impact journal. You need to see what the scope of the journal is, and pick a journal that matches your research. There's no point in in trying to publish something very specialist in a broad scope journal or trying to publish a um, chemistry paper in a history journal or you have to and it's you know you have to make sure that you look at the scope of the journal see what it says about about whether it's related to your area and then you think about what is it of interest to the readers of that of that journal and look at the way that the journal articles are structured look at the kind of articles that that journal um, publishes some of these high impact journals like nature and science they publish quite broad um, things particularly with a kind of um, impact on the world kind of thing so at the moment for example COVID-19 is a hot topic um, so that would be the kind of if you have a new vaccine for COVID-19 that gets that is you know that that's the kind of thing that you would that would be easy but if you have something that is not of so much interest necessarily to a broad range of people I would suggest you look for a more specialist journey journal for that for that area and also high impact journals are not you know they're only high impact because of the system that perpetuates them being high impact um it's not necessarily that they're better mm -hmm. uh okay. right we have, an, we have another question here yeah? I, I was going to say i mean yeah when, when it says high impact um be be familiar with what that means why why are certain journals high impact and how is that measured and also as, as shan's already pointed out some journals may claim to be high impact journals um but you really need to sometimes check their claims check the, the the index that they're based in you know if it's if it's web of science or scapus or the directory of open access journals just double check especially if you receive an email an unsolicited email from a journal that says we are high impact we are indexed in all these um places just just be prepared to double check those claims before you put all this work in and potentially pay a fee to be paying publishing in these journals. We, we have a question about here how INASP and Research for Life can work together to promote what each other are doing and I think this is a, a really important thing something that was quite striking about the people who re registered for this there's quite there's quite the communities that um, INASP and Research for Life um, work with aren't, they, they should be perf kind of pretty much perfectly aligned, but actually I think there's quite a lot of people who know about one or the other. And um, I guess we all have a role in, in sharing any bits of information and useful sources that may help others, um, irrespective of whether we run them or whether somebody else runs them. Um, Right, we have some more. We have a question about whether online, whether the courses are available to individuals or institutions. Um, individuals, you can just go to moodle.inasp.info and sign up. Uh, sign up to the tutorials now. Uh, sign up for interest for a course and we'll let you know when the course is happening next. Yeah, um, and if you are part of an institution um, and you want to, to, to potentially run one of our courses your institution let us know um, that they're, they're meant for individual anybody can sign up but um, if you want to kind of think about how it can be adapted for your own university then um, please get in touch oh John there's another there's a, question about open access which yeah be, uh, um, uh, open access journals yeah. is it good for, me for a research scientist it's a big question it depends on the journal, like just like with the journal that you pay to read. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. Uh, I think on balance, there's a benefit to publishing your, if you want to reach a, a wider audience and you want to make sure that people in, in your own country and in your field can definitely access that, then it makes a lot of sense to publish in an open access journal or also a or alternatively, of course, a journal that is available for research for life to those that community you want to reach. Um, but there are good open access journals and there are bad open access journals. There are good subscription journals. There are bad subscription journals. So no, there's there's 
it's a whole multitude of of things. How to choose a good open access journal is um, a question I think came privately to me actually. That is an enormous question. Um, mm. <laughs> we've got five minutes, four minutes left of this webinar, I think. So, um, so I'm not sure that we can fully do that. Perhaps that is a that is a topic that um, Research for Life might like to schedule for another webinar. Mm. How how to choose the right journal is a is a big question. Is a really I think big I'm just question. Trying Sean already kind of like you kind of mentioned this in a, a previous comment about identifying journals that you have perhaps found in your reading list. I think actually you, you wrote about this, Sean. It's a good way of sort of thinking ahead to what journal you're going to look to publish your research in. What have you read already? What's cited in the research that you've read already? So you just look down the reference list, you can see the sorts of journals that you should ideally be looking to publish in. Um, but in terms of choosing an open access journal, and that's a, another big question. Um, I mean, I, th I think there's, uh, some, there's some research that shows that um, if you publish open access, you are more like, there's a, you're more likely to be cited. I think there's some recent re research on that. So it does have its benefits for your research to be open access, not only in terms of citations, but also in terms of reaching the public, reaching policymakers, industry, and just a broad uh, as audience as, as you possibly can, really. Um, We've got a very quick question here. Is NEPJOL supported by INASP? Yes. NEPJOL is one of the journals online journals. Uh, it is, as with all the current journals online platforms, it's now managed and run locally from Nepal. We originally set it up in partnership with, uh, my pronunciation is not great, but um, Tripurvan University in um, Nepal. And over the course of the time of, of it, of, from it being set up until a few years ago, um, we were handing over the management of the whole process and it's been run um, locally, but we still provide support with um, editor training and with the journal assessment that I was telling people about. Which index system of journals is most reliable? Wow, I mean, yeah. um, <laughs> I mean that, that's a very subjective question. I, 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 th I think in a way, um, subjective answer rather, I would say you've got your very commercial databases such as the Web of Science, such as Scopus, which are very rigorous um, and you could say they're very reliable as well. And um, perhaps there are other indexes which are broader and have um, sort of more geographically diverse. I think that, for example, the directory of open access journals um, is a very good source, particularly if you're looking for an open access journal in which to publish in. Yeah, and it's worth remembering that no journal, no list is perfect. So it's worth looking at several lists and it's worth just recognising there are biases like uh, Web of Science is predominant, predominantly English language journals. Uh, if you particularly want to publish in, in a different language that's not English, I mean, obviously we're doing this webinar in English, um, then that would be of an important consideration. Um, and I put a link here to Think, Check, Submit, which guides through the kind of process and has some links to journal databases and some ideas about how to pick them. Um, and I think we are um, unfortunately out of time. This has been a real pleasure um, to speak with you all today. Um, and thank you very much to Research for Life for hosting this webinar. Please do keep in touch with us and uh, you know, ask us more questions, follow us on, on Twitter and yeah, stay in touch. We hope it was useful. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Andy, for your presentation. The webinar recording will be available on the Research for Life website. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.